let's start with talking about the compiler and I'll just share my screen. And by the way, uh, up here somewhere, there will be um, a, a view options thing coming up when I share the screen um, where you can say fit to window so that you can all see everything that's on the screen. Move this a little bit out of the way, that way as well. Okay, um, if, you, if you remember we had this, um, last week we had this, uh, this program that calculates prime numbers. And I think I should go into a little bit more detail about how to compile these job, these programs. Um, as I said before, um, compiling means um, turning the source code that you've written into machine readable code. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to look how that looks. Um, and see it's a little bit like that. So um, this is the actual contents of the file here. And this is some sort of explanation of the of the CPU command that that this um, this command would execute. And the the compiler to do these things, there's more to it, but there are three I, I want to com uh, con uh, talk about three different aspects of the compiler, um, of what the compiler does. The, fir the first thing the compiler does and doesn't do that automatically, but it does it here, is it runs the preprocessor over the source code. Now, if you go look at back at the source code here, you see here these um, so-called pre-compiler -co pre directives. They um, start with an octothorpe. Uh, I think they have to be at the beginning of the of the uh, line, I'm not 100% sure. It might also be dependent on the preprocessor that you use. And then there are cer certain um, uh, program, uh, certain keywords. In this case, um, it's uh, it looks whether the um, whether the keyword auto is defined um, in this in in this uh, when when this is executed. Now to, to define it, I could do two things. I could say, put in here the, I could basically tell the compiler when it reaches here, I should define this keyword. But in this case, what I'm doing is, um, is uh, I, I can do, no, let's go a little bit back. Um, I, I'll show you what the preprocessor does to this code, to the source code first. So if you run i fort uh, minus ep, that means just run the preprocessor on this file and um, print the output to screen. And I'm piping this into less. So you can see um, that if you compare this here, oops, that the First, first of all, obviously the preprocessor directives have been removed, but also um, everything in here has been removed from the code, and only this is this is still remaining. And what I can do to say I want to define this auto is uh, minus capital D, and then I keep typing auto. That way, I can basically tell it, okay, I want to have this keyword auto defined, and when I run this now. Now you can see that uh, these directives, uh, that, that, that these fixed values are in there, um, these values, and all of that has been removed. There are more preprocessor uh, pre directives that I'm not going into deep, too much detail about here, um, but it, I think it is important that every time you see something like that, uh, you need to understand that this is a preprocessor directive. Now, in order to, the, the, the compiler needs to know that it needs to run the preprocessor. 
um, by default, it would not do it. And what, I'm, what I've done here is there are two ways to do it. The first one is to use a capital F in the file name. So um, as you can see here, I've used the capital F in the, in the, in the extension, and that is a hint to the, to the um, compiler that I want the compiler to run the preprocessor first. Um, if I were to try to run, um, uh, so if I do this, that works fine, more or less. Uh, Link out. So this work, this runs fine. Um, this is part of the of the third step that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, this, but if I were to to put the, to just change this to a lower case. It's the same file, but this should give me, um, the, the, now it's comp complaining about the presence of these preprocessor macros because I have not told, it doesn't realize that it needs to run this thing. And that gives me the second option. I can just tell it with another option that it should run the preprocessor. So that way it also works. Um, There is also uh, I'll talk. I'll, I'll first talk about the other two steps. The second step of the processor is the actual compilation, the actual translation of the source code into in, into uh, machine code. So um, this is this is the default. This this is always done, and. What you get about what you get as an as a result. So if I'm if I'm if I'm running this this again, oh yeah. Every time I run make, it 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 shows me here which co which commands it executes in which order. So um, just as it would have done the same thing if I had typed everything like this out, just because I'm using this co the, the command make simply um, is a short form for executing the all these commands. It automatically checks what needs to be done. So you can see here that I that in these first two lines. I'm, I have this option minus C. That's also something that I used up here. Um, that basically tells the compiler stop after the stop after the compilation process. If you look at if you look at these files, typically .o for objects. These are the um, these are the uh, translations of your source code into machine code. But they are not surrounded yet by all the the, the meta stuff to actually um, start and execute the program. And that is done by the last step, the linking step. Um, in this case, in in this case, I'm just running this command that does the linking, and that basically moves all the different pieces uh, together into one single uh, executable. So this is um, this is always the final step. Um, you see here, I always use the minus O and then the file name that I wanted to keep it as when I compile. So this this line up here basically tells me con convert this program, uh, this this source code into this object file. Don't link. Then convert this source code into this object file. Don't link. And down here, it ju it just says put everything together um, and create the output file prime. Now there are many more options that you might want to use um, for this for the in, uh, Intel compiler. There are.
many, 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 and I'm not going through into all of these. Um, but there are the most, so the most important one obviously are minus O to tell it which output file, how you, how it should, how you, if you wanted to name the output file. Um, and minus C if you don't want the linking yet done. Then, because if, if you, without these, you can't actually, you, you can't actually compile it at all. The next ones. Uh, are optimization. Minus capital O is the optimization level that goes from minus O0 to minus O3. So minus O3 means do a lot of optimizations and kind of the, the, the special source of every compiler is how well are they at optimizing your code? So Intel claims that they're really, really good. Um, you can also, there are other options for, for individual steps that they can take, but the most common one is simply using minus O. Um, the default usually is minus O2. Um, and this is about um, reasonably good. Uh, if you go faster, it might do some optimizations that introduce some bugs. But O2 is usually a good, uh, a good choice, and that's why it's a default. Let me quickly show you some, something about what uh, impact that has. Uh, So I'm now, oh yeah, it, it worked. So now you can see that I've added this um, flag minus O zero. So I have made absolutely no, no optimization. And let's also remove this auto so that I can run the command. So you can see that now it, 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 it calculates very large a lot of very large uh, primes. And let's have a look how much it takes to calculate those. Uh, do I have the data file? No, okay. So time is a, is a bash program that basically checks how long the execution of a file, uh, of a program takes. Now, because we're running on Gadi, it might be that there are other effects. So like, there's also like how much is, how much else is running on the log, login node at this time. And in my experience, yes. So without any optimizations, it took uh, about, in this case, it took about 40, 24 seconds. By the way, uh, and now I'm, optimizing it with the highest optimization level. And I'm running it again. And let's see how long that takes. And hopefully it gets faster, it should be. So now it, now it ran in 10 seconds. Again, because this is a multi-user system, you can, I, I was not able to correctly predict that if you have everything controlled, this, this um, higher optimization should definitely be faster. Uh, do I have other things? That are... um, there are several, um, several good uh, options for, for um, debugging. So, In, uh, with the Intel compiler. By the way, some of these, like the minus C, minus O, and minus, um, minus D, these are all very standard. So all compilers will use the same ones. This one um, enables compile time warnings. Have I? Let's 
create a compile time warning. I'm just declaring another, inte an, another integer variable here that I'm ne never going to use. And this should, and so the, the compiler now tells me, hey, you've declared a variable here that you're not using. Are you sure that, are you sure what you're doing? So this is, there are other, um, there are other things uh, that this can warn you, that this can warn you about again, it depends on the, the compiler and the compiler version and stuff. What uh, features of the uh, of the source code it detects, but um, in this case, it has detected that I've created a variable that I'm never using. So that is that is your first indication that something about your source code might not be how you expected it to be. Um, then uh, in I thought backtrace is also a very useful. Um, it's also a very useful um, feature because that um, shows you um, if if your model if your executable crashes, it gives you some sort of information about what happened, um, where it was in the program to back uh, to to when it crashes, and also probably. Co a useful feature together with this is this minus lowercase g. Um, if you look at the object dump again, that I've done before. A little bit down. It now tells me uh, this is the feature of this minus g is that in this source code, it kind of stores which file, which line of the code, and what the actual code was. And um, together with a with a debugger or a proper stack or, or tr a stack trace created by this backtrace, when you crash, this gives you very good information about exactly where in the model um, a crash occurred. And that is uh, one of the first things you want to um, you want to use if if your model crashes. Um, these are uh, minus g and minus backtrace are the earliest uh, the, are things that I always use um, if I go back and 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 if I can go go back and compile the the model again. As I said, um, this is uh, a quick introduction about the, in my opinion, most important uh, compiler flex. Um, if you don't have Interfort uh, compiler, you, if you use GFort, uh, GFortran, which is part of the of, of GCC, um, some of these are different. So, for example, the uh, backtrace is uh, uh, minus f trace back, I think, and um, minus one all is, I think, the capital W all. Uh, G and the, the G is the same. This is the same. This is the same. So you have to kind of uh, know your compiler, but um, almost all of these are always available. Any more questions about the compiler? Looking here over here to see if, if anyone. Let's see what looking. No. Uh, okay. Um, let's go over here again. Sorry, Holger. I have a question about compilers. Like, uh, is there any reason to choose, uh, except for preference, like personal preference of a compiler? Is there any reason to choose one of the compiler over uh, another one? Um, generally, the the compilers um, there is not a not. All the compilers should be able to compile the same code. If if it's Fortran compliant, 
um, but different compilers will have different um, uh, will be different differently efficient, but will produce differently efficient code, uh, particularly with this optimizations and, and these kinds of things. Um, the Intel compiler is, as the name suggests, uh, man managed by Intel, and um, their, they, their system, uh, they, their people uh, put a lot of effort into making sure that their compiler produces code that is really heavily optimized for Intel CPUs. So um, if you have, if, if you're running on an Intel computer with Intel CPUs and you have access to the Intel compiler, I would probably use that compiler. If you just do it on your home computer, uh, use G Fortran because it's free. Um, there are a few others, but the main difference is always how efficient is the code that I'm running. And sometimes it might be that one one is a little bit faster than the other. So occasionally it's it's part of your, your profiling to maybe try a few different compilers and see which one produces the best code, but the, the fastest running code in your in your source code. All right, thank you. Okay. So um, we've looked at the source code before uh, last week. So we have the program, we have the, we have which modules it uses. Um, we, we use one intrinsic module and one um, that I've written myself. Um, then we declare all the variables after the implicit none. Um, that, then here we get our the, the values that it, uh, the the input values to calculate what it's supposed to do. Um, we have here an allocatable array that we that we are now know the size of, so we create it. Um, we open a file, and here we then call um, a, con a a subroutine that is contained in the main program. So this is one of the ways how you contain sub procedures um, or, yeah procedures inside uh, so that that it can um, that your program can can call them um, is to use it in in the contains block but what if we <coughs> have lots of these sub subroutines um, what if we or what if we want to make these available to different programs. So we kind of want to create a library of that. Well, that is what a module is for. And you can see up here, I'm using this use mod prime. So in this mod prime is this file. So you can see it, it's kind of similar. Um, it does use module instead of program. So this one was program prime. This one says module mod prime. Um, it can also use other modules. It does, have, it, it does have an implicit none statement. Now below there, I could declare variables. I could declare variables, but the module itself cannot contain any, any, so, any um, uh, executable code. So I cannot say something like uh, print hello. So in the program, that would be fine once, once all my variables are, are declared. But in a module, this doesn't work. This would fail. But in the module, I can also have this contains block. And in this contains block, I can now have um, other procedures. And what you can see here is a function, which is the second type of, the second type of procedure. The first one was, uh, was a subroutine. Um, a subroutine is, is here as subroutine, then the name of the subroutine, open parentheses, uh, and then the list of dummy arguments. And is executed by the, with this call command, call, and then the name of the subroutine. 
a function is similar, this is declared with a function and down here an end function command or statement. And then also it has a name, open parentheses, a number of dummy arguments. And again, we can use this dummy arguments the same way, but because a function is something that returns a value. So we have to give um, the type of returned variable, uh, the, the type of the value that is returned. In this case, it is, uh, it is a Boolean logical. And then to call it, we simply use this just as um, we as as a ver as we would use anything else with that type. So we in it's a it's a it's a boolean. So it's a logical. Fortran calls logical. It's a logical um, value. So we can assign this. In this case, we assign the output of this to a logical variable p. So you can see here that's that's a logical variable. So we have we have to give the the um, the type of the um, of the dummy arguments, and the but also the type of the function itself. Um, there are different ways to do that. Uh, you could also have written logical function x, and then you you don't need that. But um, I usually I usually try it this. I, I usually write it this way. Um, I also have. I can also. Um, declare internal variables. Sorry. Oh, I don't have anything to drink. Um, so these, these are variables that are simply part of this function. They are not available outside of this function. And then inside the function, I can, I can very much have um, executable statements. So we, we have here several um, several if statements. So in this case, well, if it's if it's smaller than one, then it's not a prime. Smaller or equal to one, then it's not a prime. Oh, um, maybe I should declare, show what this means. I could, I could write it like that. Um, but this n is, uh, is an integer of a specific kind in 64. So um, I usually try to compare, if, if I use these, um, these constants that I, if I just sprinkle a value in there, I always tell it, it should be the in, an integer value one, but the kind of whatever I need, I'm using. And you do that by um, appending after the value underscore and then whatever the kind you've, you've used before. So you can either use these, um, the same value here. You could also, if you know it, you can use uh, one underscore eight, um, but that's again, it's not a uh, Fortran standard to use numbers, that, to use such a number. So um, I would always use this in uh, this, this kind of thing. And so if, if it's smaller or equal to one, then it's not a prime and return. Return means, return out of this procedure. It works both for subroutines and, um, and functions. Um, nothing else after the return statement is executed. Otherwise, so th then if it, if it isn't smaller or equal to one, then it, e then it leaves this, then it passes over this if statement, then it comes the next. Is it two? Well, then it is a prime, so return. Then I check whether it's then I check whether it's um, it's even. So I know it is not two itself, otherwise it would have returned. And I know it's not zero because um, otherwise it would have returned here. So I just check is it a multiple of two? If it is, I again return. And if it isn't, it, so if it is an odd number larger than two. Then I check, okay, how, how much do I even have to go? So I, I'm looking for the, I'm, I'm um, casting the number, which is an integer into a real value. So this is, this is just a, a conversion from an integer number into a real number. So it was just 
adding dot zero or something like that. Then calculate the square root of that and then converting that back into an integer. And I'm telling here the kind again, similar to what is the same kind up here. The kind uh, should be like that. So because we know to run, to check for integer number, we only have to try to divide it by all numbers up to the square root. Because if, if we haven't found a, divide, a divisor be lower than the square root or lower or equal to the square root, then we are, we know that we're good. And then up here, it's, uh, it runs through this do loop. So it just, con it just checks um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's divisible by any of these numbers. And if it is, it just says, no, it's not a prime. Um, technically, I could, here I could exit because you know, we've, we talked about this last week, an exit exits the innermost do loop. So I could use the exit, but um, that is one of the things that I wanted to have optimized uh, with, the, with the minus 03. So that's why I uh, commented that out. And then it return and then um, <clears throat> that's actually not true. By that time we know. So either 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 it has found a divisor, so it's set to false, or it's still true from before. So by here we know whether it is a prime number or not. Now <clears throat> with this function being in an external module. This function, so I, I, I talked before that, that here in the check, we still have access to this iOS, to this main programs um, variables that aren't explicitly overwritten. <coughs> but because this is in a, because this is in a module, it does not have any access access to any variables that are in the scope of the of the calling procedure. So um, it does have n because it explicitly requests n. You have to use you have to give it um, you get you have to give it a value for n um, in order to calculate it, but uh, in order to call it. But it doesn't have any access to any uh, programs other than other than this. Any questions about modules so far? Okay. Um, I think we've done most of the most important parts of the Fortran language I've, I've talked to about. Let's talk about a few more, um, a little more, bit more obscure things. For example, types. Um, so I'm just, I'm just adding something. Type declarations can also be part of a module. In fact, they often are, actually. Scott has given me this pro, has suggested this file. So I've, I've kind of asked around for, for files that are part of an actual model, whether we could use this. So this, this source code is part of the Australian uh, uh, cable model. So all, as you said, all, as you see, this is just a header that basically just comments, tell, tells, tells us what this file is, what, who, who is, is it being maintained by, um, stuff like that. And you can see that here it, it starts the module and down here it will have an end module. It has an end module. So it's, it's, it's a module. And it also has um, it has lots of these types. A type is basically a conglomeration of several 
uh, of several variables. So for example, I could say here, I type um, square. I could take a type, I could declare as type square. Um, and then I could say, uh, and, and then I can say the type square should contain um, two real x and y. What this does, it, it allows me to, to now define things. It, it allows me to, de to define a variable called my square that is the of type square. So it has, it has these components. It can also have others like something like that. Um, and once I have this, and I think I'll go, I'll go back to this one here. Because now, now I'm, I'm back into my little Hello World program. To in, or, in order to, to work with these, uh, all of these have to be in the in the variable declaration, obviously. So my ver my square is a variable, and I could say I can now access it. My square um, with a percent sign. I can I can access these sub. Um, the, the sub, uh, the, these sub these these variables inside it let's hope that this is less than 20. I don't think that will work but uh, So you can see that now it, it prints a simple square. And that is what's happening here quite a lot. So we, you're, you're, that you're declaring um, these variables. Um, so you're declaring them of type real, and then you give it a name and immediately it immediately assigns a value. You don't have to do that. Um, they do it here. And always you see a comma and then a, then a, then ampersand. And that just means that the line continues. So this is for the compiler. This is this is all one huge line, uh, all the way up to down to here. And again, so on. It, it declares lots and lots of types. So here here it doesn't give them values. Uh, that is interesting part. Maybe we can talk about that later. And um, then, but then it also, it goes into this contains and then come here's in this case, subroutines. So all proceed procedures that, um, that this module should, uh, wants to do. Uh, are there any questions about types?
Yeah, so what's what's the point of using those those types? Uh, I, I see, I see you can contain several variables in it, but is there any advantage? So there are two advantages of that. Um, the main advantage is that you can basically group va values together. So if you have um, like if if you look at the, if you look at these things, um, pointers. Uh, If you look at if you look at these things um, by simply assigning, I, I could um, in this one here, I have everything under the under the square. So if I if I for example needed to run um, call a subroutine, uh, so for example, um, calc area, my square, and then I could have here. Um, Contains uh, subroutine uh, area SQ um, type square Q, um, and then I can say print star comma SQ percent X times SQ percent Y. Um, so this is something that you could do. Um, you you only have you don't have to give all all these values in individually because quite frankly, if you look at yours, if you look at the the models, often you already pass a list of 20, 30 um, values into each subroutine, and that way to simply bundle a few of those into a single one makes it much easier to keep track of that. Does this make sense? There's also, um, if you want to go into object-oriented parts, so Fortran does have a, a few object-oriented um, features. I'm not going into them at all, but that way you could also, um, as with this type declaration, you can also associate certain procedures with, um, with a type if you want to do that. Um, that, is the, that is the main uh, objective of types. Okay, any other questions about types? No. Okay. There was something else, else that I might said I might want to talk about. Pointers. Do I want to talk about pointers? Pointers are dangerous. Um, I'll probably not go into too, too much detail with pointers because they are really dangerous. A pointer is instead of of um, storing um, the value of. So the pointer behaves a little bit like a variable, except that it doesn't point, it doesn't store the value of the variables in memory in, in this pointer, but instead the address, memory address of the value. So that way you can have different pointers pointed to the exact same memory location, and then changing it with one will also change this value in the other. Um, it's very, very dangerous, and you have to keep very good track of that. If you can avoid using pointers, I would strongly advise uh, using, um, not using pointers. Uh, there's something else. I'm, I'm just looking through the list of topics that I wanted to cover. Um, in Fortran. Did I get, did I go through all the, can, can someone remind me whether I um, went through all the conditional things? So I said, if um, n equals equals two, then 
Um, so this is this equals equals means, of course, the same as it does in most other languages. If n e n and two is n is two, then this is true. Otherwise, it's false. But there's also the in the old version of Fortran that's uh, that's written like that. So this is complete. This is exactly the same thing. Did I talk about these uh, older uh, e equivalents to the to the um, conditionals? Think not yet. Uh, so equals equals means are they the same? Um, slash equals, which is so as, so not in all, most other languages would be exclamation mark equals, but of course that would mean that this is a comment. So in Fortran it's slash equals or uh, dot ne not equal. Um, smaller or is uh, lt for less than. Uh, smaller or equals is less or equal. Um, similarly, greater, greater than, greater or equal. Um, then, of course, there is, which I probably talked about, not. So, not n less than two. So, that would be not. Probably want to put parentheses around that. Um, so if n is less than two, then this is true, and not means exactly invert that. So then uh, there's end. So that would be be standing between two things. And this edge actually works both ways. Less than five and n greater than one. So that would only, it would first evaluate these these two individually. So this might be true if it's small, if, if it's smaller or equal to five. This is only true if this is larger than one. So, and, and because it expects both of these to be true, um, it, uh, it only return the whole thing only returns true if it's, uh, if, if n is between, it's larger than one and smaller than or equal to five. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about general programming practices um, that I think is, is quite important. Um, you can You could, you can use these terms. You can use um, these equals with um, with real values, so so with floating point values. But that is really bad form um, because the complicated way that um, that uh, real values are stored means that you can always have rounding errors, and then even if they look really really close. They are not actually the same thing. So this might be false, depending on how I have calculated pi, even if I think that it should be okay. So never use. Um, I, I I would strongly advise against using these equals uh, uh, comparing floating point val values for equality in any programming language. Um, of course, um, that. Smaller equals, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you if you need to check um, for for specific uh, floating point values, usually what I would use is um, in this case would be uh, absolute of pi minus this value is smaller than some. Some small value, so that would that that would check whether the difference between my value and the target value is reasonably small. Um, if you want to loop over multidimensional variables,
some, let's just say something. You can do this this way, but, and, and if, if you were writing in C or something, that would be perfectly, perfectly good. But because Fortran stores, the way that Fortran stores these arrays, these multidimensional arrays, um, you should, if any way possible, always loop, have the inner loop going over the first, the, the first index and so forth. So I would, um, uh, I would do, always do it like that. So you can see that um, X here, uh, X is the inner loop and Y is the outer loop. This is, this is indeed much, much faster. It has to do with the fact that <coughs> um, the compiler, the, the CPUs are really efficient in loading um, continuous memory into, uh, into the CPU quite fast. Um, so you want to, if, if possible, you want to um, up to to uh, work on memory along the axis and work along continuous memory. Uh, I think I got through most of the stuff that I find really important. We're almost five to. Factor two. So, yes. Okay. So let's. How how do you have questions about Fortran? Do you, did probably you should have. Uh, did you, could, could you come back to the difference between subroutines and uh, functions? So uh, you put subroutines inside modules and you put functions inside no. programs. And does that mean that you, you could, can? No. You could do either. You can put both subroutines and functions both in uh, modules or in this main program. You can also put them into their own source code, which I would not recommend. Um, it's an old method and I would strongly advise against that. Um, but that is not the difference. The difference between a subroutine, the, the, a function returns a value. A subroutine by default does not. Um, so if you, if you look at, uh, at the two, in this, in this program, I, I use exactly one subroutine and one function. So you can see here, check, I call it because there is no return. I, um, it, I, it, doesn't, it, doesn't return, it doesn't return anything. So I, I can't, um, if I were to just write in, in, in Python or C, you would simply write this, check open, and then the, the, it would identify, okay, this is, this is a, a, fun, a call to a, sub, to a procedure. Um, in, in Fortran, you have you can't do that. You have to use this keyword call for a subroutine, whereas um, a function returns a value. So you have to use you have to do something with the, the with the value that that is returned. So is prime always returns a true or a false in this case because that's the way I programmed it. But every function returns a value. So you always have to catch it some way. So you either have to use it. Um, you, you either have to do it uh, to assign it to a logical value, or you could also, um, if you wanted to, come on. Uh, you could also use it in here um, like that, uh, but something has to happen to the value that is returned by the function. Does this make sense? Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But then, um, uh, subsequent question, kind of related. Um, does that mean that if you can you can run a program, but you cannot run a module, right? No, you cannot run a module. A module, as I said, uh, a program. You only you, you can only have one program, in 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 your in your uh, in your um, in your project, um, and. Uh, but you can have as many modules as you want, as, as you need, because the program basically tells you this is where the program starts. The, let's for a moment ignore these um, these preprocessor directives. This is if you when you when you compile your project and link your project, this is the first line of code that is executed, and that is because this is the first line of code in the program in the program statement. Now a module. 
you don't have any so any source code here, any executable statements here. You can't have any print, any assignment, anything else, anything like that. Um, this you can only declare stuff in here. Only in the contain only in the contain section can you actually put um, put procedures. So a procedure is either a function or a subroutine. Um, I'll remember what I want to talk about, but it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> uh, so a, pr a procedure is either a function or a subroutine, and that can that can uh, go only in the in the contain. That can co obviously contain executable code, but that has to be in the in the in the contain section of the module. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Holger, uh, I have a simple one. Uh, can a module contains another module? Uh, no. Um, I a program cannot contain another program. Um, if you wanted to do that, uh, you have. There are two ways to do that that I could think of. The most obvious way is to um, confirm, convert one of the programs into a procedure, so either in a, into a subroutine or a, or, um, or a function, yeah. then contain that inside a module, and then, um, and then use that module inside the other program. Right. Okay. Um, so you could, you could um, if if I let's, okay let's share this again. So in here, I could simply replace this with subroutine. Yeah, I give it a, an empty one. I of course have then here and subroutine. Yeah. Then I have um, module. Yeah my prime contains and now i could use i could use this module and then i could call prime as a as a subroutine right yeah yeah okay yeah so this is what you can do there are other ways you could have two programs and there are ways to call a different program but that base, what that that basically mark does, it's it uses your your operating system to start a sub process uh, for a different program, and that's not something I'm going to to talk about. It's technically possible, but that's it, it's it would be a hack. All right. Okay. Thank you. Can I add something? Sure. Um, Diego was asking about a model in a module. You can't have that, but you can always use a module in another module, in which case everything that is in the first module is uh, available in the modules that use this module. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. By the way, maybe while we're talking about modules, if you declare, if you declare variables in a module, so in this case, I have declared uh, an integer and, a, and, and the square, variables in a module. Now, if I use this module in two different procedures in my, in my main program or in, in, in other modules, they would all have access to the same value. So I could use this to use a module to communicate between two subroutines, for example. Does this make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. No worries. Oh, lots and lots of questions in there. Uh... Yeah, um, I just see that uh, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, I, there was a question, Scott already answered it, but um, you can, a function returns exactly one value, but this value can be of any type. So you could declare a type that then contains all the variables that you want to return or 
you can do and that is that you can do with both functions and subroutines you can declare dummy dummy arguments as intent out or intent in out and that way you can you can write values to these dummy arguments inside your procedure and then after you've after you've call uh, in 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 the calling procedure or calling program afterwards these values would be set to, to this so this is the other way to to get uh, data out of a subroutine Yeah, I just noticed that this is exactly what Scott wrote. Uh, well, Scott was really good in the, in the chat, I think. Are there any questions still open? No. Okay, then um, thank you for coming. It's, it's good to see so many people. Um, have a feel free to message um, me or uh, or the help desk if you have comments about this. This is the first time I've given a, a Fortran um, course. Um, this also, the, the, the format of this Fortran course was also a kind of an experiment. I'd like to see how that worked out or if, if we would have gone, if, or if it would have been better to simply introduce every aspect uh, individually um, and not in context, so to go through that. So I'd, I'd really like your feedback about this. And um, next week, uh, Claire will talk about VS Code, which is the uh, which is the um, uh, IDE that I've been showing off to program Fortran. Um, it's really useful, particularly if you want to uh, work on remote machines. And I can only encourage everyone to come back next week uh, to Claire's talk. And that's it. Thank you very much for coming and have a good day.